the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, Episode 21. Welcome to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. Welcome to another edition of the Global Energy Leaders Podcast. As always, I'm your host, Ryan Ray. So good to have you with us again today as we bring on the biggest names in energy. And today is no exception. We will go to Central America and talk to Alejandro Brenes and really find out what is going on down there and all the complexities in the energy sector. So we'll get to that in just a second. But first, a quick reminder for our giveaway Alex Epstein's book, The Moral Case for Fossil Fuels. All you have to do is go to globalenergymedia.com. The pop-up will show, and you can enter for a chance to win that. Now, let's get to what you really want to hear, and that is Alejandro talking about Central America energy problems and how to solve them. Without further ado, here's my interview with Alejandro Brennis. Alejandro, we've been looking for a guest to come on to talk about Central America for quite some time now, and so we've, we finally found a guy who really knows the area and has done a lot of business in the area. It's so exciting to have you on. How are you doing today? Hi, Brian. Ryan, it's an honor to be here. Um, everything's good, and hopefully you can, you know, uh, learn a little bit about the Central America and Latin America region in the energy landscape. Absolutely, and you used the buzzword right there. What is the landscape of Central America? And kind of define that for the audience as you would use it as someone who's down there. So when we say Central America, where exactly are we talking about, and what is going on in the state of energy in that region? Sure, you know, uh, Central America is between uh, Mexico and, and Colombia, and there there's a lot of really small countries. Uh, from from a practical point of view, Central America, you know, it would be great because there we are really, uh, you know, a lot a lot of small countries, but uh, we are really different from each other. Uh, we have Guatemala, El Salvador, Honduras, Nicaragua, uh, Costa Rica, and Panama, and Belize that it's in Central America, but it's kind of, you know, no, normally you don't take into account Belize that much uh, because, because it's, that, it's really different. And, you know, and, you know, also in the energy sector, every country is, um, is really different also. And it, you know, around the world, like specifically in the energy sector, you don't have like, uh, like a standard business model or how the industry is developed. So, you know, just to um, give you a little bit of, of what's going on and, and the market structure, you have uh, Guatemala, El Salvador, and Honduras, which it's called the, the, the North Triangle, and they are heavily dependent, dependent in oil exports. Um, and uh, you have Nicaragua. It's also um, a, a monopoly. Um, also, you know, an important part of the electricity matrix is, is uh, based in uh, imports, in oil imports, and you have Costa Rica and Panama, um, and these two countries are based in hydroelectric power. Uh, most of the electricity comes comes from hydro, and uh, you know, historically, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Salvador, uh, Nicaragua had a really um, a really high electric electricity price, uh, but with the down the the, the the with the diminution of the of the uh, oil price that changed a lot, and uh, Panama and Costa Rica that were like the champions of renewables, uh, and they are they still are, but um, electricity become more expensive because it's not like supply and demand but more based on P, on long term ppas uh, so basically you, you you invest in in renewable energy but you're going to pay a ppa for 20 uh, even 30 years so you don't have much space uh, regarding prices um, and well and in in one thing that unites most of the countries is that the electricity it's uh, much uh, expensive than in the U.S. It could be two or three times in in most of the states. Uh, so that's a, a huge issue because our because our uh, purchase power is is obviously lower than in the U.S. Um, and that's really 
and that's also really related to the competitiveness of every country. So it's it's quite an issue in every country, and you know, you have lots of of decisions and lots of experiments um, in the in the electricity sector. Also, you have like a really open market, like in in Guatemala, in which you could do like private PPAs, and you know, private investment can easily uh, make investments in in hydro, coal, um, solar, wind energy, and you have like uh, like a pure monopoly like Costa Rica, in which uh, a state-owned company controls the generation, transmission, and the distribution. Um, so yeah, you know, it's kind of uh, really interesting each country um, and you know and, and every country has evolved differently in the in the last few years um, and re- regarding the these new changes from the upside of renewable energy to the uh, fall in prices of the of, of the oil prices. Well, you, you, you brought out a lot there, and so I want to come back to some of that. But first, I want to kind of ask you this. Um, Mexico, as you know, has recently kind of gone under a energy policy change over the past few years. Are the Central American governments looking at that as a positive sign and something that they may want to model? Or is there still some pushback and they kind of like the way they have things in place right now? Well, you know, in fact, there are a couple of countries that are more more advanced than Mexico. Uh, for example, uh, Guatemala and and Honduras, uh, excuse me, Guatemala and Panama uh, have been like pushing for for more uh, like free trade policy and uh, promoting the foreign direct investment in the in the energy sector and bringing out rules so that that could. Um, could 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 mean more economic development. So in the case of of Guatemala, for example, they have a, a really mature um, regulation. You know the, the the rules are clear, and uh, um, you know companies can can make um, energy investments relatively easy. So for example, uh, if you have a sugar mill, and you can can generate can generate electricity, then you can sell that to another uh, private company. For example, you know a factory that produces um, you know uh, food, um, and you know the the rules are clear, and and that has fostered you know a, a really competitive market. And right now the prices are really low. Um, in the case of of Panama also, for example, uh, you have a spot market and you can do merchant plants. So uh, just with a, with, with a few permits, you can, um, for example, invest in, in a solar plant. Uh, there, there was an experiment and it, it didn't, uh, for, uh, for example, a developer uh, did a, a, a solar plant and it didn't need a PPA, just, you know, it, it sells to the spot market. But it was just before the uh, oil price crush. So obviously, you know, it wasn't a, a good investment. And, and right now the prices are really low. So, um, it, for example, in those two countries, it, they are they are more advanced than, than Mexico. And and obviously, you know, it's, it's a clear, um, like... It's like a clear milestone for for Latin America that all like the bigger countries are adapting to this new uh, energy environment, and it's not a matter of choice; it's a matter of competitiveness. So I think that uh, these new changes are good for the whole region. Okay, you've thrown out a term there, a term there a couple of times, and so break this down for the audience for the, for the ones who may not know what is a PPA and how does that tie into this process. Okay, well, uh, it's it's a power purchase agreement. So basically, you can charge for for the kilowatt hour or you know other types of, of charges related to the to to the electricity market like kilowatts. So uh, when I I talk about a, a a PPA, is that for example, a developer um, you know uh, invest in a in a in a hydro 
uh, electric plant and for example it could sell it to the government in the case of costa rica that's the only way you do it and you can sell it for uh, seven cents per kilowatt hour um and in the case of you know private pas it could be like uh for example that a uh, a private investor invests, you know, puts a, a solar plant and it sells the kilowatt hour that the planet, that the, the, the panels produced to uh, the final consumer. So, you know, it, it's, it's um, in, in the region, it, it's, it's pretty normal to, to talk about PPAs, but mostly with the, with the government entities. And it's normally it's, it's long term, it's 20, 30 years. Okay, and just want to clear one thing up. You mentioned um, some of the more free markets and some of the more government owned, but are there any of the countries in Central America where the where the uh, landowner can actually own the minerals, or the minerals owned by the nations in each of these uh, countries? Okay, regarding the the mineral side, uh, you know, it's we, we don't have an industry of of, of uh, we don't have an important industry of of minerals. Um, just there are a couple of of mines in, in, in Guatemala and, you know, a, a small production of, of oil and also in Belize, but the other countries, uh, because of government policies, um, even though they say that we could have, um, natural gas or, you know, oil, uh, because of, um, government decision it it hasn't been you know explored and and it's it's not it's not an issue right now um you know it's basically it's like the whole countries are betting in in renewables we'll get back to our interview with alejandro but first let's hear from our sponsor today's podcast is brought to you by audible get a free audiobook download and a 30-day free trial at www.audibletrial.com slash Ryan. And the reason we did this is quite simple. We keep having on these authors who have amazing books. And when I say I've read the books, I've actually listened to them. I've I've shared my audio files with a few of these people because one of the neat things about Audible is you can share one free book from your library to a friend. And so I've shared the Moral Case of Fossil Fuels and the Frackers because those are books I just absolutely loved. And I've talked to you about them. We brought the authors on to interview them. So here's what you can do. You can go listen to those books on Audible with your free 30-day trial. You get one book you can download for your first month. And if you're not interested in those books, they have 180,000 others to choose from. And I can give you recommendation after recommendation. If you've got any questions, reach out to me. I can tell you about sales books, marketing books, business books. They've got it all. AudibleTrial.com slash Ryan is where you can go to get your free audio book and your free 30-day trial where you can listen to your audiobook on your iPhone, Android, Kindle, or any other MP3 player. Okay, and so um, one of the things I was curious about is that, you know, if we look at Africa, there's a lot of these African nations where they have, like, these power initiatives, and they're, they're, you know, their, their goal is to get to power to the rural and undeveloped areas by, you know, 2030, 2035, 2040. What can you tell us about the governments in Central America? Do they have these types of policies in place, and where are they at in the process if they do? Well, you know... Um the region is pretty different in Africa because in Africa they focus about access to electricity and in Central America it's about how we can lower the price of electricity. So uh, many things are happening right now and for example we have like uh, borders with with the relatively two giants you know for for one for one side, you have Mexico that is 10, 10 times the size of Central America from a GDP point of view. And you have Colombia, that Colombia is like the equivalent size of, of the whole Central America. So um, these countries are oil producers. And one of the strategies is how you can connect yourself um, to these bigger countries and, you know, try to... Uh, get advantage of that that base load that that they have because of oil, and try to bring the oil prices down. Uh, excuse me, the electricity prices down, and we, without making big investments. So, um, and and the other part is a big focus in renewable, and um, there are lots of investment in hydro, in geo, in geothermal. We have lots of volcanoes in in these countries. Um, and Costa Rica is one of the leading countries in the world in, in geothermal energy. 
and El Salvador it's also pro heavily promoting that um, so in in the region we don't we don't see like um, like a specific goal um, but we see efforts of the con of the of the governments in the countries um, trying to n not focusing that much in access uh, because most of the populations has, have access to electricity but how uh, we can bring the electricity prices down uh, so that we can foster uh, economic development. Absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, so you've touched on just renewables and you kind of thrown out some different terms. Um, so my first question is, if, if we get into renewables, is, okay, let's just step back. If you talk about Central America, there's a lot of water. And so I know that some of these European uh -huh. nations, they put the wind farms out in the oceans. Is there any kind of talk, or is that already happening down there? Or what's the state of wind farms? Is it more on land? Is it in the ocean? Where, where are those kind of plans at right now? Well, you know, uh, 100% of the of the wind plants are, are on, on, on land and you know we we have like the 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 wind we need uh, on land to, to do like all the wind farms that, that we need. It's, it's it's a matter of, of investment. And the other part and the big issue is uh, we have lots of natural resources like you mentioned water, wind and solar. Uh, but how you can control that because of the of the you know that you don't have that energy all the time. So uh, what happened and it was uh, uh, a couple of years ago it was it it was that the rainy season was was really weak, and when you have countries like Panama and Costa Rica that 70 80 percent of of all the electricity comes from hydro, you know uh, you like have uh, you know the the alarm sounds, um, and you know these countries like start to investing also like in 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 Panama, for example, how we can um, have like a natural gas backup, uh, and that's also also a, a huge challenge. Um, and in Salvador, it's the same, but since we don't have the infrastructure and since we don't have natural gas. Uh, it's quite difficult to implement that. It, it it could. The only way it makes economic sense if is that the whole uh, region, all the countries are in the same line, and like normally what happens in politics, and obviously when you you talk about several countries, is that they want to have the plant in their country. Um, so you know we are kind of in a, in a gap right now, in which we, uh, investment in renewables is. Is the strategy in all the countries, but still we have the side effects of the intermi intermittence of, of, of this of these technologies. So that's that's uh, the issue we're facing right now. Okay, so if I'm hearing you correctly, what it sounds like is this for Central America, they're trying to figure out the formula. Okay, we need this much hydro, we need this much wind, we need th this much oil and gas, this much coal, and they kind of have a formula built out that encompasses when you have a light rainy season or a heavy rainy season, so that way there's not these these gaps, because as we all know, um, renewable energy is dependent on some kind of force like the wind or the sun or the water or whatever. And so those changes in the environment can drastically affect the power out output. And so it sounds like if you're trying to figure out what is a good formula that gives you a good balance where you don't have too much infrastructure, but on the flip side, when maybe you don't have a long rainy season, you have enough you know, uh, natural gas sitting there to go ahead and to put into use. Is that kind of how I'm hearing this play out? Well, yeah, you know it, that's that's the idea, but it's quite it's quite an issue that the the investment and the logistic uh, trying to bring natural gas to the region. So you know um, you, you have like different kind of plants, and you have like for example solar that in the region twenty percent of the time it's producing, and and in in with wind energy it's around thirty to forty percent, and you have different kind kinds of hydro uh, that it could be like 60 or 90 percent and geothermal it's 90 percent um, and obviously you know the oil and coal plants it could be 100 percent um, because you use it you just turn it turn it on um, one of the of the strategies that it's happening is how um, we can promote geothermal uh, because it's a renewable energy and it has um, 
uh, a high, you know, the, the plant has a, a high a high factor. So you can you can use it in in night and in the in the dry season and the rainy season. Um, and the other big elephant that we have in the region is transportation, um, because you know even though in the electri in the electricity side, all the countries are going to renewables. Still, we have um, you know a hundred percent of the of the transportation it's oil based. And if you sum up the um, uh, the part that we are producing uh, of electricity with with oils, we're talking about around 70, 75% of the energy matrix in the region is it's based in a, a, on oil that we, that we import. So, you know, also we are trying to see how we can um, promote electric uh, vehicles and transportation um, because the resources that we have are more in the renewable side than, than in the, the minerals and, and, and oil side. So, um, you know, that's the big, the big issue, how we can smooth things up in this transition towards uh, renewable energy. Okay, and so one final question here before we move on to our last topic is, if you're listening to this podcast right now and you're going, okay, well, you know what, I, I have something to offer for Central America. I have some technology that maybe could come in and plug into this system, or I'd like to invest. What is the state of, of these governments looking for foreign investors or foreign companies to come and do business? Is it an easy transition for companies to come down there and work, or is it kind of, you know, a... Um, for lack of a better term, a you know kind of a legal nightmare where they got to jump through all these hoops to get business entities set up. What, how does that transition work? And you don't have to get into all the details, but is it an easy process? So if someone's listening and they say, "Man, I, I would really like to go down there and bring my services," is that something that people from the U.S. or anywhere can go and do? You know, L Latin America, it's a nightmare. Um, I put you, and uh, you know, I can tell you an example. One of the you know uh, of the more renowned uh, developers in in wind energy in the region. Uh, he's from the U.S. and he he had, you know, he he had worked around the world in Africa, Asia, Europe, uh, the U.S. and and obviously Latin America. And he said that, um, you know, Latin America is is the most difficult co uh, region to to do business and and the energy landscape is is not the exception. Uh, you have to. The thing is that from a market point of view, we have lots of needs, but it's really difficult um, to get things rolling and and to introduce a new technology. For example, the um, normally we are involved in in the in new laws and regulation from regarding uh, the energy sector and distributed generation, for example, and you know it it was for example in Costa Rica. We had a 14-month um, impasse uh, where, when, where, when, you know, people and companies couldn't install solar panels, panels because we we didn't have a law, and and you know, and everyone agreed that you know distributed generation was a good thing, but you know, just making decisions and you know, and going to the institutions, it it took more than a year. And you know it, it's yeah. Unfortunately, um, it's 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 kind of a problem. And the other problem is that um, the logistic between countries is really complicated. So uh, it's really difficult for you know transnational companies uh, to to do, like to have like a headquarter and to go into several countries because every country is so different. And you know, cross-border integration or and, and commerce is you know, it's really difficult. And that so you know, besides, you know, every country, if is it small or, or big, like you know, Panama and Mexico or Costa Rica and Brazil, it's their own world. World, so you know, it's um, it's tough. But we have the we have the issues and and there's lots of potential eventually to implement many technologies that are being developed in the U.S. Okay, so we'll let you go with this last question here. You are tied up in the World Economic Forum and really kind of involved with that organization and what's going on there. 
one of the things that they're talking about in that organization is the fourth industrial revolution. And so, you know, people hear that and they go, what the heck is this about? So can you kind of break that down? What is the fourth industrial revolution? Where is it at? Is it happened? Is it happening? And what can we look for as we hear more about this topic being discussed in mainstream media? Well, yeah, you know, um, there are, there have been several revolutions, and 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 in fact, most of the world world still still is in in the in the second or, or third because many people right now don't ha- don't have access to electricity or don't have access to internet. So you know, it's pretty unequal. Uh, but regarding the fourth industrial revolution, is that it's exponential changes that are happening uh, related to uh, the Internet of Things, uh, big data. Uh, new technologies, um, and one of the mo- the most important I- issue, I think, it's uh, you know that the o- o- automation of many of the jobs, you know, that basically with this transition, it's one of the the problem is that, for example, autonomous vehicles, and you have like in many many countries a fight between uh you know the taxi industry and uber but eventually um you know uh, cars can drive themselves and all these people what are what are they going to do um in the in the positive side you know it's it's like having huge advantages uh, in the health sector and also in the energy sector and you know this kind of you know, not in the near future, but right now, for example, for example, using a blockchain or Bitcoin, uh, that could eventually be the uh, facilitate the transaction between prosumers of 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 electricity. So, you know, eventually, you and your neighbor can do transactions of electricity if you have solar panels or something like that. And you know, with this new technology, eventually, it could be like. 100 percent transparent and you know um and you can monetize in really easy in in all of these these things so one of the in 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 this fourth industrial revolution uh, one of the industries that you know has been more disrupted is the the energy sector and you know right now you have like utilities that were founded like 80 years ago and they, they were like cash cows and right now they are losing money and you have all these new technologies and you know it's pretty interesting to be right now and you have to read a lot because you know changes are happening every month uh, so that's kind of a, an overview of the 14th industrial revolution it's it's affecting all of us right now and it's going to be um, affecting us even more in the next few years Absolutely. And you mentioned big data, and we hadn't really talked about big data much on the show, but for those listeners, we do need to do an episode on that. That is really exciting technology that's that's here, and, and it's it's going to change the way that we can just do a lot of stuff. And so I'm excited about that. that, that stuff that you know not a lot of people know, but you're starting to see more and more people talk about it. So that that's exciting to hear you know, people getting excited about just data, which is something that, you know, a lot of people don't care about on a day-to-day basis. Okay, we'll let you get out of here. But before we do, um, go ahead and plug and promote anything that you have, your company, where you may be, conferences, you know, speaking forums, whatever you want to get off your chest before we let you get out of here. Well, uh, um, I'm the CEO of Enertiva. Uh, We are focusing distributed generation in Latin America. And we have offices in in all the countries in Central America. And you can visit our website, www.enertiva.com. Uh, enertiva e-n-e-r-t-i-v-a dot com and you know um, we're open to discussion and new technologies and and if you want to visit uh, Central America absolutely and you know I've been to Honduras a couple times myself I don't think I've been anywhere else in Central America at least not off the top of my head and uh, I always like getting down there when I get when I get the chance to go down there. So, guys, if you are interested in doing business down there, um, you need to get in touch with Alejandro and he can walk you through maybe maybe the nightmare that you're looking at and kind of kind of make the process a little bit easier for you. But no, in all seriousness, check out their website. We'll link to that in the show notes where you can find him and reach out to him and his company and see all the work that they're doing. Alejandro, it was a pleasure to speak with you. Thank you so much for your time today. And uh, we, hope to you, have you on, yeah, we hope to have you on again in the future. Excellent. Thanks again to Alejandro for coming on and really enjoyed the discussion. And an interesting little fact here, 
um, after I recorded this episode, maybe about a week later, uh, someone reached out to me and said, hey, are you interested in doing a project in um, Central America? And I was like, uh, maybe, I don't know. You know, after hearing some of the difficulties that Alejandro brought up, it would be interesting to see how this project goes and if it's something that we will pursue or not. Uh, but just kind of thought that was interesting that, you know, I interviewed a guy about projects in, in Central America. And then, you know, within a week or so, someone's reaching out asking about doing that, not knowing anything about this interview. It was just one of those weird um, coincidences. And if that project goes, I will definitely let you guys know how it turned out and what my experience was. Um, which reminds me, if you are not connected with me on LinkedIn, please do so. I'd love to hear from you. I'd love to hear what kind of business you are in and how you fit into the energy world. There is a lot of people with a lot of opinions and a lot of different viewpoints, and we are all working together to ensure that people have clean, affordable, reliable energy. And so we'd love to hear from you. Feel free to reach out to me via LinkedIn using the show notes contact information. Guys, we love that you listen. We appreciate that you listen. Thank you so much for tuning in. And until next time, keep climbing. Thanks for listening to the Global Energy Leaders Podcast, powered by R Squared Global. 